Okay, uh, we are ready to start, and uh, the first uh, topic will be presented by Christian Browning, who is uh, second second time here. Uh, uh, Christian works as a supporter for LXC and LXCD project, works for open source for years, and uh, we have to say welcome, Christian. So hi, yeah, this is my second time here, actually. So it's a pretty good conference, as yes, you can see. We all keep coming back. Um, uh, and today, yeah, well, you basically introduced me already. So who am I? I'm this guy, I work on low-level stuff, uh, mostly on the kernel, on Lexi and Lexi, that's what I'm maintaining. So container runtime, essentially. Um, yeah, and I've recently been working on something that we like to call device namespaces. And I'm trying to convince you that this is a real thing. But you can argue with me. Um, right. So the way I would like to do this um, is basically if you have questions while I'm explaining things, or if you know for a fact that something that I'm saying right now is nonsense, you should just tell me right away instead of just let me go on. Um, so right. The way I want to do this is I'm uh, first going to introduce basically what devices are in Linux, not in any sort of depth, because I probably can assume that most of you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, I have to talk about Netlink for a little bit. Uh, I have to introduce dev tempfs, and we're going to talk a little bit about UDEV. Is Leonard around already? Leonard's around. So if it's about UDEV, he can probably help out. Um, uh, exactly, and then I'm going to talk about what device namespaces actually are and what we did to make this a real thing and the, well, the different kinds of solutions you could think of when actually doing this. So, first of all, what are devices? Uh, so, basically, the way I tend to explain this to myself is we have this idea in, in Unixoid systems that everything is a file. So it means uh, everything should behave like a file. That's probably more correct. So if you read or write to something, um, it should always sort of, like you have the same primitives to perform operations on all things on your systems. Um, and it's the same for devices. The difference to a regular file is you can have optimized I.O. methods for device files. Like, for example, you can have splice. Splice uh, uh, is for pipes which pipes are devised, by the way, uh, send message, uh, which is a specific method for sockets, um, and there are a bunch of other system calls um, that are specific, sometimes specific to devices. Um, there are different types of devices, and you probably all know them. What, like what comes to mind? Block devices, character devices, but are those all? That's actually interesting. Technically, sockets are devices. Uh, at least if you, if you look at it from a system call perspective and how you create them, you all create them in the same way with the make not system call. And sockets are devices and pipes are devices. Um, and I think that should be, that should be mostly all of them. Um, so right, do you, how do you create them? You create them with a make not system call. Or that's usually how it's done. And the rough call, call chain for this one is, um, you give it a path, you give it a mode that you want it to have, or and then you give it a device, whereby the device number is a combination of a minor and major number that uniquely identifies uh, the device to the kernel. And then it enters into VFS make node, which does all of the permission checking and so on, and then it goes down into the, uh, the file system specific methods and actually creates the device file um, that you want to use. So yeah, there are a couple of devices most of us uh, are familiar with. The standard Linux devices that we have, full, null, random, TTY, U-random, um, and dev0. That you usually, that's basically what you need to have a fully functional um, Linux system. I think you couldn't boot up if any of those uh, were missing. And, right, so what's devtempfs? So technically, devices can obviously live anywhere on the system, right? 
they're just sort of, they behave like files. You have a system call, you can create them, you can give it a random path. So what you can do is basically say, create me device node at slash mount for a console, for a TTY, for my block device, uh, whatever it is. Oh, I, I should say, the difference between a block device and a character device, because that's what we're going to concentrate on right here when I'm talking about device namespaces. So a block device allows you to write blocks of data, right? Independent of alignment and so on. And character devices usually provide you raw device access and it depends on your driver and the actual device, what alignment is required, how many bytes you can write and so on. Um, DMA is usually done through character devices, uh, for example. So direct memory access. Huh? Sorry? Yes. Um, exactly. So uh, DevTempFS. As I said, you can create device nodes anywhere in the system. You use the make node system call or whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. Uh, and you create a device node at slash mount, for example. Um, for a TTY or so on. Uh, but there is one special location on your system where most of your device nodes live, and that's Slash dev, exactly. Um, but what is slash dev? Like, is slash dev just a directory? Is it if you if you have formatted your whole system as an X4 petition, will uh, dev like will slash dev just be another X4 directory? Is it the same file system? Yeah, actually not. It's a separate file system. So dev tempfs is what we call a pseudo file system. And the pseudo file system essentially is nothing, something that behaves like a regular file system, but that doesn't necessarily have to fulfill all of the same requirements. So examples of, do you have examples for other pseudo file systems? Sisyphus, proc, right, there is, yeah, dev tempfs, there is a bunch, auto fs, all these, all these things are pseudo file system. Uh, uh, pseudo file systems uh, in the kernel. And devtempfs is one of them. Usually never pops into people's mind that often. Um, so what is it? It's mounted at slash dev. Uh, it's kernel maintained and not by user space. Um, and we will quickly see what this means. I could give a demo, but I'm, I fear I will run out of time if I do this. But we can do this demo later. Uh, what I mean by uh, kernel maintained, um, so if you plug in <coughs> A hard disk, for example, or if you plug in some specific device and there is a driver for it, what will usually happen? A device node will show up somewhere, right? The question is who has created this device node? User space or kernel? Yes, exactly. DevTempFS is kernel maintained. That's the, the beauty of it. What was the argument for having it? So there was a big argument back in the days. Uh, so f I think there were like three versions of DevTempFS. We had a the kernel maintained DevTempFS that created device nodes and it got removed and we were like, that should all be user space. Then there was an argument going on and I think Kai and Greg reintroduced DevTempFS, right? You, of course, you know nothing about this, joking. But um, uh, exactly, so the reason for this is that if you want to boot on an embedded system, you should not, you usually cannot rely on user space to create device nodes for you because maybe you don't have a user space. You might just have a shell or whatever special uh, environment you're running in. Um, so the kernel better create all of those device nodes for all of the drivers uh, it knows about and for all the hardware you have plugged in while you boot. So on an embedded system, you can boot because the, well, part of why you can boot is because the kernel maintains dev tempfs and creates all of the necessary device nodes um, that you need. That's what I mean by kernel maintained. Ah, good in, good in time. So I, we, I can probably try to give a demo. Do you want to see demos? Okay. Let's see. Put this on here. See this? So, if, going back here, and we look at dev, and then you see dev KVM, right? Um, so what if I do, ah, let's go into a, what if I remove, it should be KVM Intel, I think. What happens if I, 
drip this module right now to device node. It's gone. So I've unplugged the module and the kernel removed the device node. But if I do mod probe, the kernel will have recreated the device node. So it's managed by the kernel, not by user space, actually. That's what I mean by this. That is tricky. Um, right. So, but uh, actually, the question is, is device handling a purely kernel thing? Like is, the kernel, like, is the kernel the only one who's actually touching devices and managing devices? No. What's the program that we care about usually? UDEF, right? Somebody said UDEF. I have really bad ears, so I'm sorry right away. Um, exactly, we have a user space part of device management, and that user space part of device management is usually done uh, by UDEF. Um, and I've linked to basically, I think, all relevant implementations nowadays that still exist. We care about, so UDEF started as a separate project. I think it was in the Git kernel tree for a long time, and then it was merged into systemd at some point. Uh, it was started by Kai Sievers and also by, by Greg, and then maintained for uh, for some while also in systemd. Um, and there is eudefd, which is basically a standalone udef daemon uh, that has been, well, basically udefd has been split out of systemd, uh, and it's usable by other uh, init systems such as OpenRC and so on. And we have uevent d, and uevent d is the uh, Android uh, udef daemon that is doing the device management for Android. And there's, there's some, actually there's something interesting about UDEFD uh, uh, with Android, uh, and I'm going to talk about this in a little while. So what is UDEFD doing, uh, doing and uh, why does it even exist? So imagine, so the kernel's job is to boot up as fast as it can, usually, right? So, but hard, when hardware shows up during, a, during boot process, it's not necessarily deterministic, if I'm not wrong. So it means, for example, if you have two hard disks, one can show up before the other, and the other way, just some next boot, the other one can show up before the other one. And the kernel will just assign device nodes to them, right? Kernel will, for example, always use def sda and will assign it to the first disk that shows up during boot, and def sdb to the second one. But there is no one-to-one -one correspondence. Like, what I mean, there is no guarantee that this specific hard disk matches this specific device node every time. So you have no consistent naming, essentially. So we have, we have a user space daemon, UDFD, which is, for example, one of its jobs is to do exactly just that, like generate persistent device names. So guarantee that FDEF SDA always refers to the same disk device and so on, that device names for, inter for your Ethernet devices are always the same, the same every boot and so on. That's one of its job. But obviously that's not the only part of its job. Like another part is managing permissions, creating sim links and so on. Like you can write complex UDEV rules because if, for example you want to sh access the device node from a different location and so on. That's all done uh, through UDEV obviously. Oh, I even put this on there, I didn't realize. Um, the interesting part is, uh, well, interesting. Uh, what I said before is the kernel maintains def tempfs, and it's the kernel that creates uh, device nodes. Uh, but it's not user space's job. And I th think this is still very much true. There was a time when systemd udefd used to create device nodes, or udefd used to create device nodes. Not true anymore, actually. So it only manages permission symlinks and does the de uh, device naming stuff. There is one implementation, actually, of UDEF that does create device nodes, which I tested, which is pretty interesting. Um, so, well, basically, you can, and I explained to you why you can do this in a little bit, but what you can do, you can send fake U events to UDEFD. And what I wanted to test is whether I can get UDEFD to create device nodes for me. And for systemd UDFD and eudfd, this is actually not possible. You cannot, tr well, let's not trick it, um, because it runs as root, and if you can send it a message, it's all fine. Um, but it doesn't create device nodes for you. But you can do it with Android's U of NT. You can get, you can basically send U events to, and I explain what U events are messages, basically. You can send a message to, uh, to U of NT, 
and get it to create device nodes, which is funny, which, because I didn't think it this exists anymore, but apparently Android's UMD still creates device nodes uh, in user space, although it's not needed anymore. Uh, the interesting part also is that if you have changed permissions on a device, I'm pretty sure, and we can test this hypothesis in a little bit, if you want, um, is that if you, yeah, if you change permissions, then, and you unload a module, then, or you remove the device, then I'm not sure if the kernel actually removes the device node or if it leaves it alone. I'm pretty sure that it leaves it alone. I think the kernel only touches the device nodes if you haven't touched it from user space. Go on. I'm not completely sure, so that's why we can probably just test this. Um, let's say I'm going to chone this to zero, zero instead of uh, slash KVM. So def KVM. And now I'm doing an R, uh, let's RM mod for KVM Intel, and I'm doing LSAL. Ah, no, it removes it. Interesting. Then forget what I said. That's why demos exist. I always thought the kernel leaves it alone. But maybe if it's different, if you, uh, if you remove the module, you're actually removing the driver, so it sort of has to strip the device node. Well, anyway, system D, uh, user space part, manages permission sim links and device naming. Kernel manages your actual device nodes and the driver. But obviously, there needs to be some, some sort of coordination going on between the two, right? So how does system D, UDFD, for example, know that the device shows up? Can, right, do you know it? Huh? Yes, exactly. It's what I said before. U events. So there is a uh, there is a mechanism basically. Uh, so you have this infrastructure, and now you need a mechanism that you can coordinate between the two of them. Two of them, right? Uh, so you plug in a device driver. Uh, the kernel creates a device node, but user space currently, at least as far as I pitch this whole thing, has no idea that there is a device. Uh, and U events are there to exactly solve this kind of problems. Uh, so they are basically uh, simple messages that the kernel sends out when a device gets plugged in. I put, well, how do I do this? You see what I'm doing? Oh, probably not. Huh. Uh, you see these key value messages separate by zero bytes using the following schema, and then you see that it's a typical, should be a typical U event message. Action, def path, action, action, def path, def path, subsystem, sequence number, and so on. Uh, I can probably also easily, sh easily show this, uh, what I mean by this. So, if I do udef, uh, udef ADM, monitor, K, which is basically saying, listen to U event message that gets sent out from the kernel. And now what I'm going to do is, if I can get it out of my pocket, I can plug in my phone into my computer. At which point there will be device nodes created, because it's a USB device. Oh yeah, I have one USB slot left. So now look at the screen right there. Ah, if I ever get it in. So there's a whole range of messages being generated, and I just trapped myself. Um, so you see, there's a couple of actions. USB, there's a driver, SCSI is involved, uh, there is a, a bunch of block device or a block device created and so on. And you see this device path right here. This is, this is the action um, that you see, add, bind, change. It's ba basically the verb, what happens to the device. And obviously, you'd have uh, ADM monitor, parses them, puts them in a nice form. Uh, but the actual way this message is received uh, is exactly what I put on the on this side. So the form is like just one string. Um, and really the, the interesting, well, not the interesting part is, but these are all separated by zero bytes, which makes them interesting to parse, obviously. So you need to know the length of the message, obviously, that gets sent from user space and so on. Then you need to keep on parsing and parsing until, until there is no more information to be had. <coughs> 
So the interesting bits for this are located, the whole infrastructure uh, is uh, in lib k object u event dot c, uh, which is this function right here, k object u event dot env, in which you add your environment variables. Um, and then there is a function called k object u event net broadcast, which is probably not around anymore since I removed it, but um, basically uh, this is the function that sent out all of the messages to, uh, to user space. So um, the kernel has a minimal set of requirements uh, in the sense that every U event message uh, gets added this action, bind for example, at, and then the device path, then again like this, uh, this key action equals and again add the device path, then the subsystem, usually it comes from, it's not, I think most of the times it's there, and then there is a monotonically increasing sequence number, so U events keep counting up. Uh, all of the time, so they never stop. There is, a, I think, U64 in the kernel. So if, you, if I plug and unplug my phone, we'll just keep a, the U event sequence number will keep incrementing. Um, exactly. And then each driver, for example, can decide uh, I want to add additional information to my U event message uh, that user space can use to parse them. Uh, I don't know if you have an InfiniBand device that you plug in, and then we can. Gen put random information in there in your driver probably. Uh, probably put a string like hello world in there. And then based on this, if you know the driver and you know what it puts in its U event messages, uh, then based on this, you can also write custom U dev rules for your driver uh, to trigger when such a U event is uh, received. Uh, but how, and now I'm going to talk about uh, Netlink, and this is actually this is a conversation I had on, on Twitter, the infamous Twitter. Um, it's actually a pretty cool definition, I think. It's the duct tape of kernel space and user space, and it's sort of right. This was the original idea behind Netlink. You have a generic way to exchange messages between the kernel uh, and user space. Uh, every, like, has anybody ever worked with Netlink, like written Netlink code? Yeah, you, somebody looks very sad already, I can see, but <laughs> obviously, yes. Um, so I'm, I'm very sorry if, if you, you are here and you have implemented this, but I have worked on, on that link and I've changed quite some code there. So it's, I think it's sort of fine that I'm complaining about this, but it's a horrible, horrible API. And it's horribly undocumented. Like It's so flexible and there are so many things you can do with it, which is great. Like You can really do a lot of things. You can configure network devices, you can remove them and so on. You can even now operate on different network namespaces by sending along network namespace identifiers. That's all great. The problem is it's, it's too flexible and it's not documented, as I said. So if you look at MAN7RT netlink, which is a specific netlink type, then you will find a slew of options already but it's not even like I think it's not even a quarter of what actually exists. So if you want to know what you can do with Netlink, the only way you can find it out is read kernel code. And I should blame myself. I have added options to Netlink and I have not documented them. So <laughs> I'm very. One has to admit his own faults, right? <laughs> I mean, right. So. Um, we don't care about Netlink in general right now, but there is a specific, so one thing is you, you open a socket uh, in order uh, to communicate with the kernel, and these sockets have different types. Um, so first of all, uh, you, specify, you specify the generic socket type, I think AF Unix and so on, and then you say what specific type of Netlink socket you, you want, Netlink routing socket or whatever it is. We care about a specific type of socket that is called Netlink K object U event. So you specify that you want to open a Netlink socket, and you want to open a Netlink socket of type net Netlink K object U event, um, and it's an unprivileged socket protocol. And for a long time, it was read only, which means so you could open it as an unprivileged user. And if you, if I, for example, uh, unplug my phone uh, and or plug it in and unplug it, I can still see all of the U events that get generated uh, on my system. That's all idea, but for, usually for unprivileged users, it's not very helpful. And if somebody plugs in devices, and DEF is usually accessible by all kinds of users, so you already know what types of devices are there. Um, so that's the whole idea. So Netlink is used to transport these U events to user space. So what UDFT usually does in user space uh, is it opens a Netlink K object U event socket uh, and listens for all of these U events and parses them and then looks at the sequence number and so on and triggers UDEV rules based on this. 
yeah, a netlink is used for this, uh, which also means, by the way, that it's tight so that these messages, you event messages, are tied to network namespaces by definition because netlink is tied to network namespaces. Uh, okay, so now we're in the age of containers, um, and I'm not going to talk about them for a long time. User space fiction, Serge Helen said this back in, like, I think 2012 or something. So, uh, like, it's, it's a nice phrase. It's basically a kernel concept where you smash together a bunch of interfaces to create an isolated environment, make it as safe as possible by using all kinds of security features, uh, user namespaces and LSMs, and then you use cgroup for resource restriction and so on, but you probably all know what containers are, so I'm not going to bore you. But one of the big pitches for containers is obviously that they make device access sort of trivial in the sense that, right, if you want to pass through a device uh, to a VM, you have to do device pass through, right? And depending on how it's exa ex exactly done, like a typical scenario is you usually want to have two graphic cards, right? Uh, especially if it's not virtualized, because if you hand off one of your graphic or your GPUs into a VM, it will vanish from the host, which is usually a bad idea when you're running a system uh, in this moment. So if you have, you need two GPUs, for example, to uh, plug in a GPU into a VM. For a container, it's pretty easy in the sense that, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, in the sense that you can just hand off device nodes. They share the same kernel as the virtual machine, right? Uh, so they don't need to do their own PCI handling and all. They don't virtualize any devices and so on. That's all. They share the same kernel. They share the same infrastructure. You always get access to the real hardware and so on. So the only thing you actually need to get the, or grant device access to a container is create a device node for that container and hand it off to them. The only thing that you need, obviously, that you need to watch out for is that the kernel driver handles multiple device access. So if the kernel driver for the device you're interested in doesn't do this, then obviously this is, this is a bad idea. Um, but uh, actually, this is a valid use case. Like now, we live in the age of SRIOV, so single root input output virtualization. And without going into detail, who knows what SRIOV is? Ah, yeah, obviously, Marianne. Uh, exactly. So basically, um, let's say you have an Infiniban card, uh, and you, uh, it's just one single, it's one single physical card, but you can, for example, split it into multiple virtual cards, and you have a physical function, and these virtual, uh, these virtual devices are called virtual functions, and they're very performant ways of virtualizing hardware-based uh, multiple devices. Uh, which is for network devices something that is pretty interesting. It's also used by now, I think, so AMD has a driver out uh, for GPUs. So they have virtual GPUs. You can, for example, I think the driver I've seen is like 16 or something, uh, separate virtual GPUs. And NVIDIA has, I think, a similar concept. A friend of mine at NVIDIA at least mentioned to me that there might be something like this. But I'm, uh, yeah. So SRIOV, it's actually there for GPUs. They haven't upstreamed a driver, AMD, I mean, yet. But it's going to, uh, it's going to become a thing. Um, and obviously, these virtual devices, are, you can easily hand them off to containers. Because the idea is you, can, you have 16 of those devices. You have 16 containers, for example, running. You just hand off one of those devices by giving the device node in, into the container and granting it access. And the access is also exclusive, uh, meaning you don't run into problems with the driver and not being able to handle multiple device access. So there is actually a use case for, or an argument to be made uh, that you want to use devices from inside containers. And anyways, even, even if there are plenty of arguments against it, the problem is so the real world looks like a bunch of people are doing it already. <laughs> so the GPU workloads are a thing uh, for AI and MI uh, in containers. But there is a couple of problems, obviously. So first of all, um, that DevTempFS is not namespaced. Uh, and it's also not mountable in non-initial user namespaces. Uh, so... Oh, who knows what user namespaces are? Okay, so that we need, oh, we will get this done. But basically, uh, user namespaces are a big, big security feature uh, inside of the uh, inside of the Linux kernel. And so, uh, assume what carries privileges on a standard Linux system? Well, UIDs and GIDs, right? So if your UID or GID, if your UID zero, you have all the privileges usually. 
Um, if you're not UAD zero, usually you don't have any privileges. Then you have capabilities that you sort of can use. So you can set file capabilities on a binary, and if you execute that binary, they get added to your permitted and inheritable set of capabilities. And so you can elevate privileges. You have, can have set UAD binary to elevate privileges and so on. So all kinds of uh, privilege concepts that exist on a standard Linux system to work around all kinds of quirks, for example, being able to perform privileged operations as an unprivileged user and so on. Uh, obviously, if you run containers and they share the same kernel as you, um, but you're interested in running any sort of interesting workload, or for example, running a separate init system, uh, 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 yeah, a separate init system or a container um, uh, on the same kernel, then you need some sort of guarantee that privileges don't, like, basically don't get meshed together, such that, for example, the init system that you run in a container. Uh, will not be able to shut down the host. It will not be able to change global resources. It will not be able to execute binaries or access files it doesn't have access to, uh, to and so on. So somebody came up, well, Eric Biederman came up and a bunch of others came up with the, with the idea to sort of, well, let's create something that is a namespace that is exclusively there to virtual, basically virtualize privileges on a standard Linux system. I'm searching for a better word for privileges, but I'm I'm not coming up with on one right now. So to virtualize UIDs and GIDs, for example, so what you ideally want is in a container, uh, in a separate, a separate environment, you want to have the impression that you have the same permissions that you have on the host while being unprivileged on the host. And the, the way that it's done, for example, if you run, if you create a new user namespace and you run a process inside of a user namespace, then the process inside of the user namespace will appear as if running as UID zero. But if you switch back to the host namespace and look at that process from the host side, then you will actually see that it runs as a completely unprivileged user. Um, so I can probably also illustrate to you what this means very briefly, sorry. Uh, right, so. Ah. ah. So this is a uh, this is a con you can see this right? Uh, should I make it bigger or is it okay? It's okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I can start a container right here, and if I exec into that container, so you see there is root right here, and if I do id u and g. Uh, uh, U and ID, IDG, then you see I'm running as UID0. Um, and let's say I have a process in there, and that process is uh, a full init system in this case. And so if I look at this from the outside and I look for this second init process that I have right here, this is my init process on the host, obviously. But if this is X init, um, but if I look at this process right here that you can see uh, uh, <coughs> great um, grep in it, that should do it. So right. So you just saw that inside of the container I'm UAD zero, but if I look at this right here, so this is the uh, this is the, the second init system this is running. This is obviously my init system on the host. This is X init, which is uninteresting. But then you see, see the container's init system runs as UID 100,000. So inside of that container, I'm not going to explain to you how this exactly happens, because that's going to take too long. But I'm happy to <laughs> explain this to you afterwards. But the idea is basically inside, yeah? Huh? Uh, cat proc stat. Oh yeah, no. So I get what you mean. Two nine six four uh, stat. Status, you mean? You want to see what? Yeah, you see right here. This one, you mean? Yeah. 
So you see it runs as an unprivileged UID uh, and GID on the host, while uh, inside of the container I appear to be privileged. And then there is all kinds, and it's not trickery, but it's basically all of the privileged concepts that you have are now charged, and this is a user namespace, so this container runs in a user namespace. And all of the other privileged concepts that you have, capabilities and all that kind of stuff, being able to change syscuddles and so on, those that are safe will be targeted against the user namespace that you're running in. So you're running in a separate user namespace from the host. Um, that's the whole shtick, and that's a big kind of, uh, that's a pretty big security feature actually, um, and it should be used a lot more. Um, container runtimes are getting around to it. Um, and it comes with a lot of restrictions, obviously. So one of the things that you really care about, for example, with uh, with user namespaces uh, to make them safe is to not grant them access, obviously, to random uh, device nodes, right? So imagine I uh, create a file system for an unprivileged uh, um, user to use, and I mount that file system for him. Uh, for them, and I change, uh, like I change the device node to the UID and GID, and then I start a container, and it runs in a new user namespace. And for example, I have placed a device node like defmem or defkmem on there. Now they can suddenly access kernel memory and write to kernel memory and so on. They can, if another attack surface is if I run in a user namespace, and I would be able to create and actually open device nodes arbitrary device nodes, and you can attack the kernel right away. You can basically have access to the, to the host. So you better make sure uh, that you cannot get access to random device nodes from non-initial user namespaces. This is one of the restrictions. The way the kernel this ensures this is that if you mount something in a non-initial user namespace, so each file system that is mountable in a non-initial user namespace is marked by the kernel with a special option basically saying this file system is safe to mount from non-initial user namespaces. And usually these are really uninteresting ones for the most part. Sisyphus, uh, proc, uh, all with restrictions uh, when they are mountable from non-initial user namespaces. Uh, uh, tempfs is another example. Defpts is another example for file systems that are mountable in user namespaces. But when you mount such a file system, the kernel will automatically be like, oh, hell yeah, you're mounting this in a non-initial user namespace. First of all, I'm going to record who mounted this file system. So it records the user namespace who mounted this. And then it also sets a flag on the super block for the file system called, it's a kernel internal flag. SB underscore I underscore no def, which means any device nodes that you create or any device nodes that already exist on this file systems cannot be opened and not be used. And it's just, this is a big security feature. Um, but devtempfs uh, is not even, yeah, devtempfs is not even, uh, you're not even able to mount devtempfs from uh, a non-initial user namespace. There's also the case where you have missing capabilities and so on. Uh, so you don't have cap make node, which is the capability that restricts your ability to create device nodes. So if you run a privileged container, a container that is not uh, uh, isolated via user namespaces, you usually drop cap make node so that the container cannot create random device nodes for itself uh, again. Um, so the problem is obviously even if I have a bunch of devices and I want to hand them off to, to the container, there is no way I can make it so that I just plug them into my computer and it gets automatically delegated, uh, delegated to the container. All of those devices will only show up in devtempfs and, and that's in the host's devtempfs. That's the only way it's safe uh, to do this. So uh, the way containers usually do this is that they mount a tempfs on slash dev inside of the container. And then for user namespaces, they bind mount all of the interesting devices from the host into the, uh, into the container. By interesting devices, I mean in order to boot a standard Linux distribution, you need dev full, dev null, dev zero, and so on. And these are usually devices that are safe to use by anyone because they are constructed that way by default. Uh, by design, and so usually just bind mount those in from the host. That's usually what you do uh, to get this to work. Uh, there is a patch set, we cannot go into this unfortunately, but there is a patch set floating around that um, uses SecCom to make it possible so that you can actually do some privileged operations for containers that run inside of user namespaces. Um, if you're interested in this, there is an article on this. Uh, there is, it's in the eighth iteration, and it should, should go in soon. Um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, said that we can talk about it, but okay. Um, okay. So, uh, what's the solution to this sort of problem? Well, 
you can have multiple solutions to this problem. Uh, well, by multiple, I mean two <laughs> that I can think of. Um, so there is a kernel solution, a pure kernel solution, and there is a user space solution. The obvious solution that you would come up with is, okay, we have all these namespaces, mount namespaces, IPC namespaces, C group namespaces, network namespaces, and user namespaces. They're all super useful. How about we, we make a device namespace, which has been tried before, which probably would involve namespacing dev tempfs. For example, that you can mount it in non-initial user namespaces so that you can mount them in containers. Uh, you, K objects is basically the in-kernel representation of, of devices or part of the in-kernel representation of devices. You could come up with a way to tag those K objects and say, uh, here's a tag, it belongs to this user namespace or it belongs to, to that uh, device namespace in this case and so on. And so people worked on this, but it was flat out rejected for being, it's being, well, it was flat out rejected at a time when containers weren't really a thing, so nobody cared about them that much. And also they said, like, it's way too complicated and so on. We don't, it's never going to happen. So a proper in-kernel device namespace is not something that was going to happen. What was suggested at one point was basically, well, we should come up with a separate solution, right? I mean, the, the boundary between kernel and user space for devices uh, is provided by U events. So we won't give you an in-kernel solution to this, but what would be an option is if you namespace U events such that you can target specific U events against specific namespaces. That's the whole idea. Um, and that's sort of what we that's sort of what we what we came up with and what we did for the last well not the last couple of, I think a couple of months, but it's been in the kernel for like four seventeen or four eighteen or something. So it, it's been around for a bit now. Given how long a development cycle usually is, I just like to change, the, uh, uh, like show this mail exchange because the patch set is it's not it's it's not really huge, uh, it's it's a line, some lines of code, but it's not massive. Uh, but the interesting part is just to agree on an initial design, like how should it even look like? We had to write 71 mails. Um, it's a very very efficient uh, development process, as you can see usually. Um, right. Uh, I have some time left. So um, the idea is basically uh, right now what happened before. Uh, how were you events sent out? So if you plugged in a device in your, um, uh, into your computer and you were running uh, a container, a user namespace container, or you were running in a new network namespace, uh, then you would receive all of those U events. So basically the kernel said for all network namespaces that exist on the system, uh, each of them has a U event socket. Uh, well, if there is a process listening on the U event socket, uh, go walk this list of network namespaces, and then for each of those network namespaces that has a U event socket, which they all have, uh, all of the listeners to that U event socket, that's a second list, walk that list and send out all of the U events. And it did it for all network namespaces and it did it for all user namespaces. So for example, if you had system containers running um, that had run a whole init system and systemd udfd, for example, is running in there, systemd udfd and all of those namespaces and all of your thousands of containers would get yelled at with U events it, it couldn't use. It couldn't use them because the kernel did send them out with invalid UIDs and GIDs. So it didn't fix them up for the user namespace it was running in. So for example, System UDFD would receive an event and it would be like, oh yeah, there's a device coming up, there's a device coming up, uh, the UID and GID are not zero, so it can't be from the kernel, it's not the, uh, also it's not the root user, so I'm just going to discard this, uh, this event. So U events were broadcast into all namespaces and no, none of the network namespaces and none of the network namespaces could make actual use of U events, U events which was a pretty big uh, problem actually, performance wise because it's a global lock. You need, you need to guarantee ordering between the U events you sent out. So you're holding a lock on a list of lists. So you're holding a lock on a network namespace list, U event socket list, and you're holding a lock on all of the multicast listeners. And then that can stall quite a bit. Um, so uh, the solution is basically, okay, why not we isolate all of those, we isolate U events to network namespaces that are owned by the initial user namespace. Uh, let's make it simpler. Uh, so you only want to guarantee that systemd udfd on the host by default, uh, your real inner systems on the on your host receives U events and no one else, because there is just no need for it. Like nobody else needs to know about those U events. Actually, why would you care? Inside, if you're running a separate system, the devices that you get informed about 
So even if you snoop on those U events, you know that on the host somebody plugged in a USB device. You can't even know them. You could even argue that it's a privilege leak or has been a privilege uh, information leak before because you got information that on the host somebody just plugged in a new GPU or whatever it was that they plugged in right now or a, a, a new disk and so on. So the idea was separate, uh, like isolate all of these, uh, all of these other namespaces, only receive it in the initial namespace. And if you really have a need where you say, like, for example, I'm taking this device and I'm plugging this device into the container, that's the only scenario where you should say a device showed up. That's the only way, that's the only case scenario when you should inform the container that there is a device going on. And that's basically what this whole patch set did. Uh, what this whole patch set is doing. So right now from user space, if you're a pri privileged process means you have CapNet admin, a specific capability in the user, in the uh, namespace you're trying to send the U event message to, then you can do so. Uh, and that's sort of how we namespace devices. So basically you can target a specific device to a specific uh, container in this scenario. Uh, there is a bunch of other fix up I did as well, but we don't have time and I really want to show you a demo. There is a bunch of future work that should be going on. That, like there is still a global lock that is really horrible that should go away. Uh, I just need to find <laughs> time to actually work on this. Uh, but let me show you a, a demo of what I mean by this. Huh? Uh, because the device's C group is horrible. <laughs> um, oh, that's the short message, essentially. So uh, let me just show you something. So uh, I, have started a, I have started a container, and I have plugged in my phone right before, so I can look at LSUSB, uh, and as you can see, there's my phone right here, this one, uh, and I can plug this in, config, device add. So what I'm doing right here is I'm adding my phone to the container C1. Uh, I'm naming the device phone. So this right here. Uh, it's a, the device type is a USB device and I'm giving it a vendor ID. Um, I should probably show you before that there is nothing in there. So uh, how is this thing called? ADB device something? Ugh. ADB scan. Does somebody know what the ADB command for this is? AD ah, ADB devices, right. So there's a daemon, and then you can see there shouldn't be any device in there, right? You just don't see any of my phone devices. So add, I'm adding the phone, I'm getting back in there, and then I do ADB devices. And then you see that's my device right here. I can even get a shell probably. Well, yeah, so that's my phone. Um, Cool, I have handed, I plugged in this device. The interesting bit is that before the patch said, like, you wouldn't be informed that this device actually got added. But if I'm doing this right now, and then I should be. <laughs> so, this is what this patch set is basically doing. So I delegated this device to my container, and then I'm forwarding only the interesting uh, U, event, U events that I actually that I actually care about. So it sounds uh, more fancy than it actually is, but it's the easiest way you can get uh, device namespaces working without mucking with the kernel uh, too much, essentially. Right. Um, ah, I can't finish, actually, if you want, right now. So I'm on time. I was close. Yeah. If you have questions, then go ahead. Yes. Purple, one second. Yes. Sorry. I can also repeat questions if you want. So my question would be uh, uh, how that permanent uh, naming is done. I mean, uh, Simlink is clear, but if you told me that it is kernel which assigns uh, some node for a new, newly inserted device, so how that renaming happens in user space, in kernel space? Uh, in user space, so uh, it's a UDEV rule, basically. I think, uh, I think systemd UDEV provides a set of uh, generic UDEV rules, for example, for network devices, and it triggers on uh, a network device that is identified during boot up, boot up and then a uh, uh, fixed name is generated each time. So that's done in user space by UDEV, right? <laughs> 
So that's a new node which gets created and... Uh, no, the node the gets, I think the node gets, either the node gets renamed, oh, so for network devices, the network device gets actually renamed. Because, for example, a network device is a device, but it doesn't necessarily have a device node. There are network devices like InfiniBand devices that have device nodes, but for other device nodes, uh, you create symlinks, for example, then UDFD creates symlinks. Okay, so say I use a USB to serial converter which gets uh, something like TTY USB 0 and I want yeah. it to be a TTY uh, my def 1. So what happens, uh, uh, the first node which was created by kernel remains and uh, the new one gets created as a symlink, right? So we have two nodes then. Uh, we well, you have one node and then it's, the other one is a symlink to that node. But uh, basically, yes. But it's done with a UDEF rule. You would write, you would need to write a UDEF rule for systemd UDEF if I understand you right, and this creates the symlink. But you can also get it to rename a device, right? File. Yeah. You can also say, for example, please rename this device node to this other name. And so that will be actually done by the kernel. So we ask no, the kernel to that, rename it. That will be done in user space. The kernel will only create the device node once for you with the default permissions that the driver cares about and then it won't touch the device node again. Everything else from that point on, once it created the device node once, will be done uh, by user space. Okay, which means device name is not a uh, device node, right? It is a separate substance. Uh, well, uh, sort of uh, the initial, the first device name is given by the kernel and everything else is then off to user space. So, yeah. Okay, uh, the next question. I have two questions, really. I'll try to keep them brief. Uh, the first is about isolation. Um, do these devices, when you pass them through to a container, do they need to be associated with something like VFI or PCI as a driver? And do you need to do any special configuration IO MMU wise? No. Do they need to be behind the same IMMU group? No, not at all. Like the thing is really, this is, uh, I think this is the, the sort of mix-up that comes, not mix-up, but um, yes, this is all wildly more complicated for uh, virtual machines. For a container, it really shares exactly the same hardware. There is like no, there's like really no isolation layer, so you don't need to do any specific... Couldn't a container then configure the device to access other parts of the host memory? The uh, what? Sorry? So, the, the, the reason you, you would have IOMMU protection is the, oh. uh, to allow the container not to, or, or the oh, right. user of this device not to configure the device to access other parts of the memory of the host. That should be, a, so you're telling me this is a hardware security feature that you want or that exists? I, I own a new something that exists. Yeah, right, I know that it exists, but yeah. You, you normally, if you want to pass through a, a device to user space, for example, yes. what you do is you configure the MMU in a way that it wouldn't allow the device to access any other memory than that process's memory. Ah, interesting. So the question yeah. is how that works for, for containers. Can, can I just configure it? If I'm on the device, could I just tell the device to read some other memory that doesn't belong to me? Uh, if you handle the device node, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big concern. I mean, that's a gen oh, but that's a generic concern. Actually, I, I talked to a hardware engineer f a while ago. Like, for example, one of the things I kept worrying about is Let's say you hand up a GPU device uh, inside, of a, uh, inside of a container. Um, and that container runs a trusted workload. Uh, it does some interesting computing. Then I strip off that GPU and hand it off to a separate, uh, to a separate virtual machine. What guarantees me, or even for the device node to a container, what guarantees me that that, that container or that, that virtual machine cannot snoop on the GPU memory that is left over from the prior process? That's a separate problem, right? That's leaving state in the device. Yeah. The problem is whether you handle the GPU to the container the container tells the GPU, um, I need you to read that memory over there and then give it to me. That, that's the concern with isolation. If you, can do this on the, if you can do this on the host, then technically I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be the same for a container. So can you only pass through devices to containers you trust then? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's sorry. That's a, a, a totally. Um, I mean, that's this whole kind of this whole kind of GPU computing thing and so on. You should ever only either you have. That's why I talked about SRIOV before. The ideal solution is obviously, you for example, you have an InfiniBand network card, right? And so it has a dedicated virtual device that is intended to be handed off to other users, like virtual machines or containers. That's the ideal scenario. So with SRIOV, you have the same problem. You still need to configure IOMMU. Uh, groups for, for isolation. 
Uh, the other question I had was about mediated devices. Yeah. Um, so with NVIDIA GPUs, right. because they don't really support a SRIOV, you have to use a mediated driver that registers the fake device to the mediated core. Uh, does that work for passing through the device? So we, we have, so the way I can only speak to how we do NVIDIA GPU uh, device pass through, uh, which I, I think I, would, I worked with Jonathan and Felix on this. Um, so basically, one of the main problems that you face, first of all, is not just you handing on of you handing in all of the necessary devices like the card device, the def Nvidia device, and the control devices, and so on that you need from inside of the container. Now you have the problem that if the container uh, inside of the container there's a different operating system than outside of the container, uh, and the libraries, for example, inside of the container don't match the driver that is loaded on the host, you're screwed anyways because there's a driver library compatibility, ABI compatibility for Nvidia. The way Nvidia Nvidia solves this. There is also a bunch of stuff like, for example, they have a persistence D demon that keeps the GPU initialized. There is all kind of black magic going on uh, that, G that Nvidia is doing, which people usually don't know about. Um, the, the way they solve, solve this is basically because they, they want to be able to hand off the GPUs to containers, uh, is that to do LD preload to tricks. They have a, called, a library called libNVIDIA driver, or libNVIDIA container or something, and you can basically call a binary that uh, as a hook during container startup that preloads the libraries, LD preloads the libraries from the host. You don't even need to install any additional drivers inside of the container and so on. So you're using the host driver and the host container. The attack surface, however, is still determined by, by the host, essentially. So if you hand it off to a container, you better trust that device. Like, that's the, yeah, that's the thing. That's the price you pay. Huh? Trust the container, exactly. You should uh, trust it, yeah. You should trust the workload uh, you're running. Okay, uh, one more. Sure. Thanks, a really good question. Yeah. Uh, Christian, yeah. Uh, please make this NetLink interface documented. Please treat yes. NetLink interfaces as, as a part of the kernel API. Yes. I I, uh, yeah. I have I literally I literally have a to-do list uh, with like because over the last year or so I think I added four or five features to NetLink and actually there is like oh I should advertise for not it's not my pet sorry but um, NetLink for example had one really crucial problem for a long time if you passed in basically you could pass in any property you wanted uh, in a NetLink message and the kernel would just happily ignore it it's like oh, I don't know what this property is so whatever the problem is if you if you introduce new properties you're now bound to breaking user space because suddenly you need to validate that the message you're sending in uh, only contains the properties that you care about, so you were screwed. And we were in a kind of a scenario where we couldn't change NetLink anymore. Somebody added a NetLink socket option, which user space should make use of, that's basically saying, um, you open a NetLink socket, and then you set a socket option that's, that states, uh, on specific types of requests, do strict property checking, and if those properties don't match, or if the header that you're sending, any type of the message not match, do a hard fail. It's also not documented. Thank but you. I will. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. So uh, let's say thank you to you. Thanks. And, uh, and uh, one more. Uh, well, well, what was the best question? Ah, uh, the IOM and okay. one. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you all have a price so with uh, coffee from my parents, this nice sleeping device for, from Simgash. <laughs> and uh, Dell MC T shirt, and you are lucky because you have all sizes now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh,